Well, good morning, Avalon. Um, my name is Matt, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Avalon. And it's family worship weekend. If you're a kid in here, let me hear you make some noise. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Let me hear you make some noise. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll warm you up to it. All right. So, so when, when I was a kid in church, um, there was no kids' church. You had to go to big church, grown-up church, every single week. And, and whenever I was there, I was always told I had to be quiet. It was always, shh, you can't talk in church. Or, shh, no noises in church. Or, shh, you can't breathe in church. We always had to be quiet. And so I've always wanted to try something, okay? And kids, will you try this with me? I always wanted to make a funny, loud noise in church, Okay. So I want you kids to think of the craziest, funniest noise you can think of. And on the count of three, we're all going to make our crazy, funny noise together. You ready? You got it? If you're young at heart, if you're an adult child, you may also do this as well. Okay, ready? One, two, three. (laughs) Very nice, very nice. Okay, kids, here's the deal. You can't tell the adults that I let you do that in church, okay? Do not tell them, because if you do, I will be in big trouble. Wait a minute. How'd the adults get in here? Who let the adults in here? Oh, man, we're totally busted. Okay, well, I guess we'll let the adults stay with us uh, in church this morning. So in, in adult church, in big church, we've been talking about this book in the Bible called Ezra these last few weeks and learning about some of the cool things that were happening for God's people in Ezra. So as we start today, let's watch this video that kind of update us on what's been happening in the book of Ezra. What's the 15th book of the Bible? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra. The Israelites are returning from exile. They've been held captive in Babylon until King Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon and tells the captives they can all go back to Judah and rebuild God's temple. Finally, after 70 years in captivity, the Israelites are going home to Jerusalem. The Israelites head back in three groups. The first group to head back had 50,000 people in it. The people were led by a guy named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, try saying that five times fast. Go ahead, I'm waiting. Too slow. When Zerubbabel gets the people back to Judah, they all rebuild the temple. Although it takes them a while to do it because their enemies keep trying to interfere with the building. Finally, they rebuild the temple and everything's great. About 80 years after Zerubbabel led the 50,000 back to Judah, another man named Ezra, yep, he's the one this book is named after, leads a group of 2,000 men and their families back to Judah. But when Ezra gets back, he notices that although the temple has been rebuilt, built, the Israelites have been breaking some of God's rules. So Ezra reminds everybody of what they're supposed to be doing and gets everyone back on the right track. Ezra, the Israelites get to go back home. It's in the Bible. Check it out. Jolly (laughs) Tally. Well, thank you, strange puppet lady or man or whatever you are for that update on, on Ezra. So what's happening with God's people is they had been taken captive and taken to a country far away from their home. And they had had to live there for 70 years. And, uh, and they felt like, man, did God forget about us? What's going on? All of a sudden, um, they get to go home. A king lets them go back and start to rebuild their houses and, and rebuild their temple. But then there was this king, King Darius, and he was really mean to God's people. He told them, stop! You're not allowed to rebuild God's temple. And that's what they called the church back then. But then, all of a sudden... Um, In chapter 6, King Darius says, I changed my mind. Not only are you allowed to rebuild the temple, but I'm going to pay for the building of the temple with all my money. You can use my money to rebuild the temple. So he goes from being one of their biggest enemies to one of their biggest helpers in this. So finally, after all these years, God's people finished rebuilding the temple. And then they had a huge party to celebrate. The temple is finished finally after all these years. Now, let me tell you something pretty cool about the temple back then. Get this. God lived in the temple. God lived in the temple. Isn't that crazy? 
God, who can be everywhere at the same time, chose to make his house in, in the church building, in, in the temple. And he lived there. Now, take a look at this picture on the screen. Even way back when, uh, when God's people were wandering in the desert, um, God lived with them. And this is a picture that somebody drew um, from a verse in the Bible, Exodus 40, 38. It says this, The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. And so God was right there living with them in a, in a cloud during the day and fire at night so they could see that God was with them that whole time. Can you imagine if you came into our church building this morning and there was a big, big cloud just hanging out right here or a big pillar of fire? Wouldn't that be crazy? But that's how it was for God's people back then, that God actually um, lived with them. His, his presence was with them in the temple. But then about a thousand years later, Jesus came to earth and things really changed at that point. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. And then God said this, the temple isn't a building anymore. The temple is you. Look at this cool verse in the Bible. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 3.16 and it says this, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? wait a minute, did you hear that? God says that, that you are the temple and that he lives inside of you. Isn't that crazy? That same fire that we saw in the picture that God himself now chooses to make us his house, to live within us. For those of us who accepted Jesus into our lives, he says, you are my temple and I now live inside of you. But maybe you're saying, but, but wait a minute, Matt, isn't isn't this building that we're in, isn't this the church? Don't we say, oh, we're going to church today, or this is happening at our church. Isn't, isn't this building the church? I'm confused. Well, let's look at a few verses in the New Testament. One verse in Acts 14 says, on arriving there, Paul and Barnabas gathered the church together. Now, wait a minute. Can you gather church buildings together? Can you go here, churchy, 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 here, churchy, churchy? And have buildings come together? No, right? A church building can't move. It's not alive. It's just staying put right there. Or in another verse, somebody writes a letter to the church. Can a church building read a letter? No. A church building can't read because it's not alive. It's just a building. And then another verse says that the church was praying to God for Peter. Can a church building pray? If I came in here this morning and, and I heard the church building praying out loud, I would freak out. That'd be scary, right? But church buildings don't pray because they're not alive. What all of these verses are talking about with the church is not a building. It's talking about people. People can gather together. People can read a letter. People can pray. Not church buildings. Before Jesus... The church was a building. But after Jesus, the church is people. Okay, I'm going to give you a test. This is very serious to see if, if you've been listening. But kids, just to be mean to the adults, I'm going to make them take the test first. Okay? Does that sound, does that sound okay? All right. So adults, your pressure's on you. I will fail you if you don't get this question right. Okay? In just a moment, there are going to be two pictures up on the screen. And adults, I want you to tell me which picture is the church, okay? Adults, are you ready? Okay, so look at the screen. Which picture is the church? Picture number one or picture number two? All right, Whew. I was worried, adults. I thought you were going to fail that one. Okay, good job. Okay, kids, it's your turn. This is a very serious test. I need you to get this question right as well, okay? We're going to put two more pictures up on the screen, and I want you to tell me which picture is the church, okay? Go ahead and look. Is the church picture number one or picture number two? Shout it out. Is the church one? Oh, I'm hearing different things. It's number one. And why is that? 
Because the church is people. It looks like a church building in number two, but the church is people. Okay, one last test, and this is the hardest, and this is everybody, adults and kids together, okay? We're going to put two more pictures up on the screen, and you might recognize these, okay? They look very familiar. There's some, some good-looking people up there in that screen. All right, in these two pictures, which picture is the church? Picture number one or picture number two? All right, and guess who that is? That's you guys. You see, we can talk about the church not being a building and the church being people, and that's, that's all fine and good, but then we get to us. And a lot of times we call this building the church. But really, God's saying, that great group of people right there in picture number two, that's the church, and that's you. And the cool thing that God is trying to teach us is that the church isn't a building anymore. Um, the church is us and how we go and, and live our lives. Look again at the screen at that verse that we talked about earlier, 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, don't you realize that all of, what does it say? You, together, are the temple of God and that God's spirit lives in you. Guys, the church isn't a building anymore. The church is you. And the church is me. And the church is us. Okay, I want to do one last thing because I'm pretty sure you got it, but I want to make sure you, you get it as we leave today. I want to do one last thing. I'm going to say the question, what is the church? And I want you to yell as loud as we, you can, we are the church. Got it? I'm going to say, what is the church? You yell, we are the church. Okay? Ready? Let's do it. What is the church? Nice. Okay, one more time. What is the church? One last time. What is the church? Nice. Wow. You guys are much louder than first service. I'm, I'm proud of you. We are the church. Yes, exactly. Guys, think about what that means. If we are the church, then church isn't just Sunday morning. Church is seven days a week. If we are the church then God doesn't just stay here in this church building and wait for you to come back next Sunday. He's inside of you all week long. If we are the church, then the church isn't just this building that stays in one place. The church is all these people moving all around our city. And if we are the church, then there isn't just one Avalon church. There's over 400 Avalon churches that are going about our city and sharing God's love with people all week long. Now that you know that you are the church and we are the church, I want to ask you this question. What is one thing that you can do as the church this week to share God's love with your family or at your school or at your job or, or with your friends? What is one thing, since you are the church, how can you be the church this week and share God's love with the people in your life? And then finally, if you haven't accepted Jesus' death on the cross for you, God can come and live inside you today, just like he says that he will, just like he did back in the temple, he now does with us. So we're going to pray in a moment. If you haven't welcomed Jesus into your life, God, to live in you, you can pray along with me as I pray. So let's bow our head and close our eyes. All you have to do is, is just pray something like this in, in your head. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving me for all the mistakes that I've made. Please come into my life today. Please come and live inside of me. Please teach me how to, how to live my life for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you love me and, and, and you love all of us. And that we get to be your church now. We get to carry you and, and your love everywhere we go and share it with the people around us as we serve and as we live our lives. Help us to do that well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. In conclusion, what is the church? Yeah. Nice. Very good. Well, I'm really proud because I promised a short sermon today. 
and I preached a short sermon today. <laughs> so um, I'm going to share a few announcements as we close, and then we're going to have a couple of our friends come up and just close us in, in a cool benediction.